Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and I want to welcome you to our very first Combo Diasorn Molecular Luminex CVS Corporate Workshop. It's really nice to see all of you here today, and for me, this is like rejoining a community of people who I've really missed for the past couple of years. So I'm really pleased that we are all here in person and I can see your smiling faces. So I'm Michelle Tabb. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for Diasorn Molecular and Luminex. And so today we are really pleased to present a great workshop for you which will cover herpes viruses and sort of the manifestations in both the adult and pediatric forms, including congenital. And we have two fantastic speakers who I'll introduce. Um, we have Dr. Preeti Pancholi from The Ohio State University, as well as Dr. Megan Pesh from Michigan Medicine. And so before I introduce both of our speakers, I just wanted to say a bit about the combination here of Diasorn and Luminex. So we are truly a unique combination of specialists. We have brought together the technologies and the instrumentation, the platforms and the applications for both of these incredible companies. And we are in the process of integration and um, sort of finding out what we can do with all these new tools in the toolbox. So just to reorient everybody for what we have here to play with in this toolbox, so to speak, the combination of Luminex and Diasorum brings together all the technologies that are shown here on the slide. So we have targeted molecular testing, of course, and we have multiplex molecular testing. We have the legacy Luminex tools, including the bead-based multiplexing, and we also have flow cytometry, so a lot of different technologies at our disposal here. And in addition, we have lots of different platforms and applications to pair together with those technologies. So starting up in the top left-hand corner, we have the instrument that uh, is in my history, of course, the Liaison MDX system, but as well as the ARIES system for sample-to-answer targeted molecular testing. And then moving down further into the IVDs, we also have the Veragene system, and we also have the MagPix, MagPix system. And on the life science side of things for the bead-based multiplexing, we have the Luminex 100-200 as well as the MagPix. And then our most recent launch into that space, which is the IntelliFlex system, which launched, launched just last year. And we also have flow cytometry for imaging purposes. So going a bit deeper into, whoops, into the IVD for just a moment. So if we just speak about our targeted molecular testing technologies, here are the assays as well as the current platforms that we have offerings in, as well as the products that we have in development. So you can see there um, the platforms that I already mentioned, which are the Liaison MDX as well as the ARIES. We have a current menu which includes COVID-19, of course, and Flu AB, RSV, as well as Bordadella, Group A Strep, C. diff, Group B Strep. HSV 1 and 2 and BZV, which you will hear about shortly from Dr. Pencholi, as well as we launched a SARS-CoV-2 variance RUO test on the liaison MDX. And actually, we've just updated that once again, as we can now even detect the Omicron BA2 variant based on post-amplification melt. And the most recent launch in the ARIES um, platform was uh, the MRSA test, actually. In addition, we have user-defined capabilities, and we have more than 60 ASRs that are available to use on the Liaison MDX platform, as well as a portfolio of ASRs for the ARIES. In development, you can see there in the bottom the, the uh, assays that we currently have under review at FDA. That includes our COVID-19 Simplexa standalone assay, which was submitted to FDA back in July. And so we are in active review and crossing our fingers for good news shortly on that assay's 510K clearance. We've also submitted a combo COVID-19 flu AB assay to FDA. And on the ARI side of things, we have flu AB RSV COVID, also about to submit to FDA. And all of those assays are currently CE marked. What you'll hear about later today will be congenital CMV, but I'm very happy to announce that we're also under review at FDA on our Simplexa COVID, sorry, not COVID, congenital CMV direct assay. And that one is pretty special in that it will cover both saliva and urinous specimen types. And those are the two recommended specimen types if you follow the CDC guidelines for both, for both screening and confirmatory testing for congenital CMV. And then we're also in development right now for another healthcare acquired infection that's creeping up, Candida auris. And so we have a sample to answer assay in the Simplexa format um, in development there. 
Moving over to our multiplex technology offerings, we currently on the platforms Veragene, Magpix, and Luminex 100-200. We have RP Flex, EP, the two blood culture panels, as well as the Nextag and Xtag product lines, including the RPP plus SARS-CoV-2, as well as GPP. And then we have the cystic fibrosis panel, as well as the CYP2C19 panel available. In development, we also have the GI Flex, the RSP Flex, and three blood culture panels, which will come to market in a sample to answer format with room temp stable reagents and a simple to use cartridge, and that will be on our Veragene 2 platform. And we have been busy during this pandemic, not just bringing products for COVID and having this integration happen between these two companies, but also moving into Clio Waved Point of Care Molecular. So this is our instrument. Uh, it's a partnership with the technology partnership, TTP, out of the UK. And this will be our liaison NES platform. And so we have really focused on the point of care molecular systems that have come before us and taken advantage of those learnings and really are bringing to get to market a product that looks at time to result, the quality and error proof nature that you expect from a point of care easy to use test, portability, and also of course keeping our eye on connectivity. And so stay tuned for more information about that product, maybe at one of the next meetings that we attend. So all in all, between Luminex and Diosorn Molecular, we now have the ability to bring to our customers, our clinical labs, everything from point of care all the way to multiplex solutions for molecular diagnostics. So you see there on the left, our point of care instruments where we're expanding into point of care, our targeted solutions, which include the liaison MDX, the ARIES system, and the other system there, which is the liaison MDX Plus, which is in development and which we'll talk about at a future meeting. And then lastly, our multiplex solutions, which include our current on-market solutions, such as the Veragene, and then the soon-to-come-to-market Veragene 2 platform. So with that, I am now going to introduce our first speaker. So we have Dr. Preeti Pancholi today, who is going to uh, give us a talk here about detection of VZV and HSV in skin and CNS infections using targeted molecular testing. So Dr. Pancholi earned her PhD at the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research in Chandigarh, India, followed by a postdoc at Rockefeller in MTB. She went on to the Mayo Clinic, Department of Laboratory, and Medi and Laboratory Medicine for a Clinical Microbiology Fellowship, and then was at the Leslie Kimball Research Institute in New York, followed by Columbia, and serving as Assistant Professor of Clinical Microbiology and Associ Associate Professor of Clinical Microbiology Service when she was there. But since 2013, Dr. Pancholi has been Director of Clinical Microbiology and Professor of Clinical Pathology at The Ohio State University Wexler Medical Center. And then today, of course, her talk will be about VZV and HSV and skin and CS CNS infections using targeted molecular testing. Dr. Pancholi. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. This is just so nice to be able to get out from behind your desk and come here and actually see so many of you here. So I'm just so elated to be here and, and see all my friends and my colleagues. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about detection of VZV and HSV. It's a very interesting topic, a topic dear to my heart. But I'd like to just start with just um, some of the things that I will be covering today in my talk. So I'll be talking to you a little bit about my lab, what we do. Um, then, of course, about human herpes viruses, with a particular focus on HSV and VZV. And then I'll be focusing a lot more on VZV initially, because we've just done some, you know, we've just done a few studies with, uh, with VZV, and it's been a large multi-center study with a lot of my other colleagues' participation as well. I'd like to describe that to you. And then uh, go and talk about uh, HSV and VZV in, in, in pediatric populations as well. So this is just a little bit about where I work. Um, so shown on the map is Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, in case somebody wanted to see where Columbus was. Uh, this was uh, prepared more for an ECMID presentation where sometimes people, you know, Ohio, where is Ohio in the grand scheme of things? So that's where we are. And uh, we are a, a hospital system of seven hospitals. And we have about 1,880 beds. Um, and as you can see, there are just a lot of specialties in each of these seven, uh, eight hospitals that we service. Um, and it is, it's got a lot going for it, honestly. It's kind of a really fun place to work. There's just never a dull moment. There's always somebody wanting microbiology and 
and wanting infectious disease testing uh, entities. Um, so that's just this how many visits we've been having, like about 2.1 million outpatient visits, and then 60, 62,000 inpatients, and then so many ED visits, just to give you a little bit of a flavor for, for Ohio State. And then the national rankings for Ohio State, which just sort of really keeps you on your toes to be wanting to deliver the best services possible uh, to our patient population. So my lab is a full service lab. We do microprocessing, bacteriology, virology, microbacteriology, mycology, molecular diagnostics, um, and also susceptibility testing. We are about 57 uh, te technicians, technologists. We have seven supervisors and one lab manager, and now more recently one assistant lab manager. And we've done about uh, more than half a million tests in the last 12 months, approximately half of them being molecular, molecular tests. So uh, we are very vested in technology, absolutely love technology, okay? This is something that's very dear to my heart. So you'll see me walking the booths and just sort of taking note of what's out there, what's upcoming. And so you can see we do offer a lot of different platforms. So we have the Liaison MDX, we have the Abbott M2000, we have the Linity M, uh, the Hologic Panther, we have the Gene Expert, the BD Max, uh, we also have the BioFire um, uh, instruments. So um, obviously we do a lot of clinical testing, but then also uh, my lab is very interested in clinical studies and clinical trials. So we utilize a lot of these different platforms and also the ARIES platform and the VeryGene2 uh, more recently uh, are also some of the platforms that we're using for doing some clinical studies as well. So pretty diverse and pretty exciting. So just getting to the topic of human herpes viruses, as you all know, uh, there are a large number of these viruses, but we are really keying in on on uh, nine of these that are more clinically relevant and that infect uh, humans. So um, what's interesting about human herpes viruses is that almost all of us have been impacted by human herpes viruses one time or the other. So almost close to 100% of individuals may have experienced one or the other of these. And once infected, always infected, right? So there's this whole thing about latency with these viruses. So once you've, been ex once you've experienced it, you have it for life. Um, and, uh, and you can see that the alpha, so they can be a subfamily of alpha, uh, beta, and gamma. The alpha viruses, such as your HHV1, uh, HHV2, your human herpes virus, VZV, for example, are, they target um, the, the neurons, um, and then the beta and gamma, they target the leukocytes. Just some broad differentiation, some classification about these. Now, I'm sure you're all very familiar with these different viruses uh, as terms of transmission, and I'll go into a little more detail about that. Uh, but once, uh, once one acquires a uh, human herpes virus infection, uh, you can get, obviously, primary infection with these. So depending on what type of virus is acquired, you can get cold sores with human herpes virus. With HSV2 type 2, you can have uh, genital herpes, uh, VZV, chicken pox, or shingles later on in life, and so on. So you can see the different manifestations of all of these different viruses uh, listed here, which I'm sure you guys are very familiar with. Uh, since latency is the hallmark of, this, uh, of, this, of the human herpes viruses, uh, these viruses can reactivate later in life, uh, either as a result of an immune compromise situation or just some injury or insult uh, that occurs uh, that can lead to reactivation. So these viruses definitely are around and will probably stay around for a long time. Now, in terms of epidemiology, you know, uh, so again, I mentioned, you know, when you take this whole virus, this is a big group, about, you know, 90%, almost 100% of, of people have experienced one or the other of these viruses. And um, so geographic location plays an important uh, aspect, important role, whereas HSV1, VZV, and EBV have been shown to be present in 80 to 90% of the adult population in all, all countries. So these are more ubiquitous. And then coming to CMV infection, um, it's 50% CMV infection has been encountered in, in uh, Western uh, Europe, whereas it is 90% in African and Asian countries. Okay, just a little bit. So there's obviously a, a more of a pre uh, predominance of, the, of this infection there. Uh, with HSV type 2, uh, it's about 20 to 70% in adults. So it all depends, again, you know, on, the, on your risk factors and so on. But that is just a broad distribution. Now, in terms of transmission of human herpes viruses, several uh, ways in which to acquire these viruses, as listed here, from droplets to direct contact, uh, sexual transmission, vertical transmission, um, uh, transplanted organs, and then blood transfusions. So it pretty much covers a lot of the gamut of what you would expect uh, to find with these viruses. 
and, and, the, and the risk factors associated with acquisition of these human herpes viruses would be, you know, obviously um, somebody who's immune compromised, adults that are, you know, older adults, uh, greater than 65 years of age, pregnant women, uh, immune compromised, solid organ transplant, so anybody with an immune compromised situation. So sometimes they're very young, less than 13 years of age, and, and individuals with multiple sexual partners for HSV type 2, for example, as well. So coming to lab diagnosis, which is one of my favorite topics since I'm a, a laboratorian and I really thrive on this, on this field myself. So you can see there are several options for detecting human herpes viruses and I'm sure you all must be doing a combination or, or some specialized testing for these in your own labs. So we have viral cultures, which we used to do a long time ago, but then we switched to more, um, I guess, user-friendly technologies for nucleic acid detection. Um, there is also direct fluorescinated antibody uh, testing, which is again being done by some labs. Uh, we used to again do that in the past, but don't do that anymore. It's kind of more cumbersome or laborious. Um, and then uh, with CMV, you can also see retinal changes or tissue biopsy as well. So several different modalities. So out of all of these different modalities, I would I would say um, you know nucleic acid detection has has at least you know, has has been shown to be very efficient. Uh, greater sensitivity, the turnaround times is rapid, so I think we can all agree on some of these um, uh, attributes of PCR as having been the gold standard now for uh, detection of human herpes viruses. So I'm going to uh, shift uh, and talk a little bit more about VZV, which is kind of a little more central for my talk today uh, because we've done some, some work with, uh, with VZV. But just again, as an introduction, uh, we know that you know, greater than 90% of the population uh, has been exposed to VZV. I'm sure we all have experienced VZV, uh, either ourselves or someone we know, um, you know as in the form of chicken pox um, or otherwise. And with VZV, we have, uh, there are two clinically distinct forms of VZV uh, that I'm sure you're, sure, you're, you're aware of. One is the lesions, like your chicken pox, right? Uh, a manifestation that occurs generally in childhood. Uh, and then you can also have neurological complications. So one is the lesions, the other one would be a neurological complication, which can includes, include encephalitis or aseptic meningitis. So two very diverse uh, clinical forms of, of VZV. Now in terms of pathogenesis and clinical presentation, this is a great slide, it's a very comprehensive slide. It's you know, sort of replaced five of my other previous slides uh, that I've used in the past to describe uh, clinical presentation of VZV. So it starts off by you know, somebody getting exposed and in, in childhood you, have, you get chicken pox. Um, and then as a, as a part of the chicken pox, uh, one can have some complications like bacterial sepsis, pneumonia, uh, encephalitis, hemorrhagic complications that can occur occasionally. Most, most people do well and they recover on their own, but these are some complications that can occur. And then we talked about having latency. So once exposed, always, always exposed, right? In the sense you always carry that virus uh, in your body. So you can have a latency period where nothing happens, but as you, as you get into adulthood, you can experience a reactivation event, again, based on you know, a situation, an immune compromise situation, or just stress. I just remember we had a graduate student who had to submit her, who had to defend her PhD thesis, and lo and behold, uh, came down with uh, VZV, uh, you know, uh, with shingles. Uh, that was stress-related. She was not 65 years or older or anything like that because we tend to think of this uh, disease as being more predominant in the, in the older population. However, this can happen at any age. Um, so lo and behold, she had half of her body uh, you know, with, the, with the VZV rash, um, um, which was really very painful for her. So as a part of that uh, herpes zoster, um, uh, you can get um, you know, acute complications, which is your meningitis, uh, meningoencephalitis, myelitis, and, and cranial uh, nerve palsies as well. Uh, this can be a very painful uh, condition, um, you know, as you get past that initial um, reinfection, and you can have a post-herpetic neuralgia, which is really painful um, as, as part of this uh, manifestation. Generally occurs in older populations. So just talking a little bit about neurological complications of EZV because this is important to focus on only because one wants to um, be ready uh, to be able to diagnose and detect this entity. So in terms of this neurological complications, one uh, needs to be aware of viral encephalitis and viral aseptic meningitis, two manifestations uh, where VZV is, is quite predominant. So we know with viral encephalitis, 70% uh, of the cases of, of, uh, are caused by viruses. 
And there's 10 to 30 percent of mortality rate um, in these uh, in these inf these infections, um, and most serious of which is obviously your brain uh, damage, uh, permanent brain damage. Um, so out of the viruses that are prevalent that are seen in these viral encephalitis, you can see there is HSV at 22 percent, but then VZV is between 15 to 23 percent. So pretty significant, um, you know, manifestation of VZV for viral encephalitis. And if you look at viral aseptic meningitis, likewise, uh, you see predominant of enterovirus uh, with the viral aseptic meningitis, but then herpes viruses is next after that. And so that includes uh, a number of different herpes viruses. But overall, there's been about 4,600 cases of viral aseptic meningitis each year in the USA, and about 18,000 cases of VZV viral encephalitis uh, every year. So pretty significant. Now, the good news about VZV is the fact that there is a vaccine available uh, for VZV that really does uh, help in reducing the morbidity and, and even mortality uh, associated with this infection. So the recommended vaccine uh, is, uh, there, are, there are actually um, the OCA strain. Um, so the vaccination was first started in 1995 in the USA. And the first dose of the chickenpox vaccine um, is given at 12 to 15 months and the second dose at four to six years. Um, and I think most of us, um, at least I know, I made sure that our children got these vaccines. Um, and this uh, vaccination is very protective and with the second dose up to greater than 98% of protective um, uh, nature of the vaccine. And then when it comes down to adults, we just talked about a very painful um, condition called shingles. So in this situation also, there are two vaccines that are available. One is the Shingrix, which is made by GSK. Uh, and it's given to individuals greater than 50 years of age. Uh, it's a recombinant non-live vaccine that is again given in two dose series, uh, two to six months apart. And it is also a highly efficacious vaccine. Uh, it is 97% uh, effective in the age group of 50 to 69 years of age and can also be given to immune compromised uh, individuals greater than 18 years of age. Uh, the other vaccine uh, for, for adults is the, is the Zostavax uh, vaccine, again given to individuals greater than 60 years of age. This one is a live attenuated uh, vaccine for children, uh, uh, vaccine, li live attenuated strain of vaccine. It's the same strain, uh, the OCA strain that was used in, for children, um, but just a much higher dose. So the concentration of this is, is much higher, it's 14 times uh, greater than what's given in children. And again, it's been shown to it reduce at least 50% uh, reduction in shingles in individuals 60 years or, or greater. So it's really good news that we do have a vaccine for at least VZV. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, diagnosis and detection uh, of VZV. And um, so here, um, I, I got these, some of these pictures off the CDC website and it just shows you these various uh, manifestation of rashes and you can see it's just really difficult to just, uh, I think even clinically for the clinicians present in the audience um, to say what rash belongs where. Uh, you know, what can be attributed? Is it HSV? Is it VZV? Is it an insect bite? Is it an allergy? Is it like uh, in terms of just contact dermatitis or something like that that might have occurred in these individuals? So in, in situations like that, especially when there's breakthrough varicella, somebody who's vaccinated and now they've come up with a rash, you know, those kind of rashes are very sort of esoteric. They're not really the real, uh, you know, it, it's just hard to, to, to put a finger on it and to, and to detect it, diagnose it. Um, so these are, this can be very challenging. Um, so we know that for a long time that PCR of the skin lesion is uh, a gold standard uh, for detecting and diagnosing uh, varicella. It's very easy to implement, as you can imagine. So you have your, uh, you have your skin lesions and you would take a swab and you would uh, you know, rub it uh, at the base of the lesion, especially if it's active and wet, that's the best time to take it. However, if it's dry and crusted, you could still be able to swab that lesion. And uh, the recommendation is to get at least two lesions swabbed just to increase your sensitivity uh, for detection. Um, obviously, it is less invasive than drawing blood. So this is definitely um, a test that is utilized, I, I believe, a great deal. Um, and, um, and the preferred thing is to get at least, uh, at least uh, two lesions swabbed. Um, and the results are generally good when it's like kind of early, within five days of rash onset, rather than waiting for everything to be crusted and dry. 
So in terms of what are the challenges when we think of uh, CNS infections with VZV, well, there are several challenges. One is um, somebody has a CNS manifestation. You don't know what's causing it. You want to be able to rule out uh, bacterial um, you know, causes, um, infectious versus non-infectious, for example, right? Paramount to be able to um, differentiate those. Um, and then if you have an infectious thing to rule out, you want to be able to get the specific etiological uh, detection as to what organism this is. Uh, now, with VZV CNS infections, we know that uh, primary infection, um, uh, you can get a CNS infection either as a result of your primary infection, like, you know, that you have, or a reactivation later on in life. And that is really difficult for us to, um, uh, to fathom sometimes. It's like, is it happening at what stage of one's exposure to the VZV uh, infection? And then also, uh, you can get VZV CNS complications, um, you know, with absolutely no zoster rash whatsoever. So it's not like this has to be a rash in which to think, oh, now the per person has CNS manifestation and there's a rash. You associate that. You could have a CNS manifestation without any rash being present at all. So this makes it really difficult uh, clinically to understand um, what might be happening. So again, uh, this basically comes down to the fact that we as laboratorians need to have uh, tools uh, in which to offer to our clinicians um, to be able to rapidly detect some of these infections. So um, these are some encephalitis uh, diagnostic guidelines that were put together by the International Encephalitis Consortium in 2013. And as you can see, obviously they talk about uh, CSF cultures in, in diagnosing uh, these infections. And VZV does figure prominently in these uh, guidelines because, as I mentioned, you know, VZV is, uh, is, is definitely an entity uh, for, for encephalitis. About 20 to 25 percent cases can belong to VZV infection. So they, uh, they advocate the use of VZV PCR for detecting uh, VZV infections. And uh, because we know viral loads can be relatively lower in CNS uh, uh, compartment, so they also say to try to get the CSF, you know, uh, tested like within, uh, within 20 days of uh, a patient experiencing symptoms. And then as part of the VZV PCR workup, one all, they also advocate getting a VZV specific antibodies in the CSF as well. So not just PCR, if the PCR is negative, to also consider getting VZV specific antibodies detected in the CSF, just to complete that picture. Likewise, for the meningitis diagnostic guidelines, uh, VZV again configures uh, prominently in, in wanting to uh, rule that out. But you obviously want to be able to rule out bacterial meningitis if somebody, you know, if somebody comes in with a meningitis symptoms. Um, and once you rule out bacterial meningitis uh, and now you're focusing on a viral entity, uh, that would be important so that can reduce the use of overuse of antibiotics if, uh, if the bacterial entities are ruled out initially. Uh, and then getting a VZV-specific PCR or getting an enterovirus-specific PCR, as the case may be, it really does help to, uh, you know, get the patient uh, taken care of quickly, decreases the length of stay. I think there's some really nice publications showing that uh, these rapid PCRs can actually help get the patient out of the hospital faster um, and reduce antibiotic use. So uh, this slide here uh, shows you all the different FDA-cleared IVDs that are available for testing VZV and HSV that are currently available. So there's the BioFire uh, assay, uh, which is a 14, 14 bacterial uh, and viral and fungal target assay. Um, so here, HSV and VZV are also uh, part of this multiplex panel. The specimen type is CSF, that is approved uh, for testing. Then there is the Quidel. Uh, method as well, um, platform, where you have the Lyra and the Solana assays, and here they have HSV, uh, 1, 2, and VZV assays, the combination assays on both of those uh, different assays, the Lyra and the Solana, and here the sample type is the cutaneous and the mucocutaneous swab specimens that are approved. Then you have the Luminex uh, platform, uh, shown here in the middle, uh, which has an Aries-approved HSV, 1, plus 2 assay. And the sample type here approved is the cutaneous and mucocutaneous swabs. And then we have the Diosorin uh, molecular platform, uh, which has a number of different assays, uh, one of them being the VZV, uh, Simplexa VZV direct kit for CSF. Then there is a Simplexa VZV swab direct kit for cutaneous and mucocutaneous swabs. 
And then there is, for HSV, there is a Simplexa HSV 1 and 2 direct kit where sample types approved all your CSF and continuous mucocutaneous swabs. So pretty comprehensive listing of um, sample types that are clinically relevant. Now, um, you know, we, 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 we see that there are multiplex assays and, and then um, there are also singleplex assays. And my lab offers both uh, multiplex and singleplex. And, you know, why do we offer both and how do we use what we use? I mean, that is a, that's a discussion we can so probably have for a very long time. But the reason we offer both of these is because they both have their place and their utilities and so on. So one of the things that, I, uh, that we do offer the multiplex panel uh, test is because we know that if somebody has a CNS infection, you know, urgency is important to try to detect the viruses and sometimes casting a wide net is important because you don't quite know what the patient might be suffering from. Uh, however, uh, this is a discussion that we have constantly in our institutions that are they appropriate for all patient types? Are they appropriate for somebody who is immune competent, for example, immune compromised? I mean, yes, maybe for immune compromised, you can throw the net a little wider. But for immune competent patients, I mean, this is, is this something that they need? For example, do you really need cryptococcus, toxoplasma, CMV, you know, performed in all your patients if they're not immune compromised? Uh, certain targets that are included in the multiplex panel, for example, HSV uh, and, uh, and enterovirus, I mean, those are more ubiquitous, more common, and can infect immune-compromised and, and immune-competent individuals both, right? But not every target listed in multiplex panels is, 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 is useful. We've had situations where we didn't know what to do with the HHV6, human herpes virus 6 result in our patients, and this was an immune-competent patient. So we, we know about chromosomal integration, and, and so those are the type of questions that I think are very confusing. Infectious diseases may be able to understand that better, but if you are in the care of a primary doctor, it really does take a lot of explaining to try to have them understand. Um, and then you're also obviously worried about analytical performance, like do all the targets perform equally well? or are some more superior than the others. The reason we offer singleplex HSV and VZV assay is because for some of the targets, uh, there's underperformance of some of these entities, and our infectious disease diseases is very aware. They read literature, so they'll tell me, Preeti, it's negative for this entity, uh, for HSV, VZV. Can you please round your singleplex? Because we do frown upon double dipping. Like, you know, we don't want them to order singleplex and then also order multiplex. Um, but, you know, everybody's savvy, they know, you know, certain, certain targets that may be, you know, um, underquantified. Um, and so, so I think those are important discussions to have. And then cost effectiveness, you know, do you do them on all your patients or what patient population and so on. And then want to make sure that it does have some kind of an impact in decreasing NMI, uh, administration and duration of antimicrobials. So now I'm going to get to my favorite part uh, of the talk, which is this... Um, uh, this manuscript that, we, that just came out from our group, uh, our multicenter group, on, on uh, Simplexa VZV direct assay. So um, this uh, paper just came out in March issue of JCM, and we're just really excited to see it in print. So this study was undertaken by about 15 uh, different uh, sites, so 15 colleagues, different institutions. We all collaborated with Dear Sorin uh, to perform this study. And the study was done uh, with the VZV, looking at the simplex of VZV uh, direct kit, uh, the CNS infections, to look at the performance characteristics. And then we also looked at the simplex of VZV swab direct kit, which was performed on lesions, uh, uh, which were your cutaneous and mucocutaneous lesions. So pretty comprehensive study. And this, again, is a, it's actually a really great slide. And uh, this talks about uh, what was utilized in the study to really uh, look at the performance of the study. So um, there are these CRMs, which is your uh, composite reference methods. OK, CRM stands for composite reference methods. So you can see with the, v, with the CSF part of the study, uh, there was, um, uh, we, we utilized uh, prospective, retrospective, and contrived specimens of about 883 specimens. And the uh, composite reference, the standards that were used to, to, to validate uh, the performance of CSF, they were these two validated real-time PCR or bidirectional sequencing assays. And then uh, one or both of the real-time assays had to be concordant in which to be able to um, have a positive result. 
Um, so it was interesting with the VZV swab assays, there was a prospective arm uh, where they were freshly collected, and then there was a retrospective and contrived arm as well. Now with the prospective arm, which are about 450 specimens, the composite reference method included your uh, uh, DFSA, which is a direct fluorinated antibody and culture combination, along with your uh, validated real-time PCR and bidirectional sequencing, okay? Um, and then the positive criteria was that two out of the three um, of these assays had to be concordant in which to call a positive result. Uh, and this was done, uh, the culture component was included in the prospective arm of the VZV because culture is considered the gold standard for skin uh, um, uh, uh, tissues and so on, and so that was included as in, in this particular um, uh, analysis. Then we had the retrospective and contrived specimens as well, uh, where uh, there were these two validated real-time PCR assays, as used above, uh, with bidirectional sequencing, but then also another FDA-approved VZV NAT nucleic acid amplification assay was used. And then again, two out of the three assays had to be concordant. Now, I know it sounds like a lot, and why am I going through this CRM1, CRM2, CRM3? I can tell you when we wrote this paper, it drove the reviewers crazy. They couldn't for the life of us, uh, life of us uh, ask us, why did you guys keep changing these things? And they were just, their heads were going round and round in terms of there should just be one standard comparison. Um, so we had to make this figure in order to explain to them how the study was done. And I really do want to uh, commend the DSR and clinical trial team for actually thinking through this and really coming up with, with uh, comparators that really does, that made sense for each of the sample type. You know, they could have done a simple job of just taking one, you know, comparator, but it was really nice to see that they actually included culture, the DFSA, DFA, as part of the uh, swab specimens, which is, and you, and you can imagine, not everybody does culture these days, not everybody does DFA, so they were able to find um, a lab um, um, which, um, which was able to do that. So this was a really good collaborative uh, study. Uh, like I said, there are 15 labs that collaborated in the study. So now getting to the meat of the, of the actual, um, uh, you know, assay characteristics. So you can see this is showing you CSF data. So in the CSF data, you're looking at the composite reference, um, you know, methodology that was used for CSF. And look at the agreement. The agreement was great. It was 100% positive predictive value and 99.7 negative predictive value. Overall greater than 99% uh, clinical uh, agreement. Now looking at the multicenter study where we looked at the swabs, and here's a prospective arm. Remember I described the prospective arm with the CRM2 and the retrospective and contrived as a CRM composite reference method three, uh, all the different uh, comparator methods that we used. And again, um, I know these are too tiny for you guys to read, and that's why we just summarized it here for you all to say there was 98% overall agreement. Uh, with, uh, our, with the study for cutaneous and mucocutaneous swab specimens using all these different um, reference standard methods. Now, we are always curious about cycle threshold values, right? I mean, I, we all want to know, <laughs> at least at the laboratory, and I love to be able to peek behind the scenes and see what kind of cycle threshold values we're getting for um, a lot of our specimens. And with the DSR and assay, you have the capability of peeking behind the scenes and getting that information. So shown here is just a comparison of your CSF, cycle threshold value distribution, and then your cutaneous and mucocutaneous swab specimens. And again, you see the much higher cycle threshold values uh, for, um, for CSF specimens only because the viral load tends to be lower in CSF. As compared to the mucocutaneous and cutaneous sites, you can see the viral loads here. You can see lower CT values, uh, and so which just means the viral loads are higher in, in these specimen types. It was also nice to see that the mucocutaneous cutaneous had a same mean uh, average cycle threshold values, just sort of showing that there is no inhibitory effect of swabs that are taken from a mucocutaneous site, you know, so there's, you know, no, we do not see any inhibition uh, with these, which is why the cycle threshold values are kind of nice to have. So, um, so this was something that uh, since we were a large multicenter uh, trial group, we were 15 collaborators working on this, uh, on this study, we had the luxury of having some of our own assays that were ongoing at the time when this clinical study was being conducted. So here uh, we are showing um, uh, the CSF samples, um, you know, that were enrolled into the study. We had our own assays ongoing, which was one of, one of them was the BioFire ME panel, the other one's a Luminex LDT assay, a lab-developed assay, and then there was a Chiagen uh, uh, lab-developed assay. 
So when we ran the uh, clinical samples for, for the DSRN study, we also looked back and to look at our own lab results on the same specimens. And we were just really gratified to see that our, our results in our own labs correlated very well with the, with the DSRN um, uh, simplex uh, CSF results. So there was 100% agreement uh, with our CSF specimens with all, of this, um, with all of the assays that we were running in our own labs. And the reason why I mention that is because in all of these different assays, we had to do sample extraction. I, in my own lab, I, do the, I did the KH in LDT at the time, and we used to use 200 microliters for sample extraction. Uh, with the VZV assays, we, the sample requirement is 50 microliters, um, and there is uh, no sample extraction. So um, that was gratifying to see that the sensitivity of the assay was really good, despite the fact there was no sample extraction requirement for, for the simplexa. So this one is uh, similarly, uh, we were very fortunate that in, with our uh, 15 collaborators, uh, we had several of us doing different assays in our lab. So when we looked at the comparison for cutaneous and mucocutaneous specimens, shown here are all the different assays that were ongoing in our lab. And these included the Luminex Aries, the Deosaurin Molecular LDT, which was, by the way, with extraction at the time, uh, Kaijin LDT, and then Medical College of Wisconsin had their own LDT based on a publication, and then there was an Elitech VZV uh, Elite MGP uh, MG assay as well. So all of these different assays, and this was something, something that was unique um, for publication because we wanted to include this data to show that um, given all our standard of care methods and utilizing the study data that was shared with us after all the data was put together, we were really uh, interested and excited to see that the correlation was 100%. So a positive was a positive, a negative was a negative uh, with, the, with the simplex assay as well. Uh, and not shown here are uh, the different, um, I guess, um, uh, you know, the media, the transport media that was used for our study. So, for example, some labs were using e-swab, some were using VD transport media, some were using universal transport media, that no matter what media you used, you had, uh, you know, you had good results. Um, so that was really uh, good to see as well because, as you all know, during the pandemic, we've all experienced the fact that media shortages and all of that stuff, and we were just grabbing whatever we could at the time. So um, the fact that the assay is compatible with different media types was something good for us to see. Um, this just shows you the limit of detection uh, for the VZV uh, simplex uh, uh, CSF um, assay. And shown here, oops, shown here is, oh my goodness, I really jumped here. There you go. Um, so shown here is just a limit of detection studies, and you know these are done in limiting dilutions and, and replicates, where you're trying to find, you know, in your probate assay, 95% detection. So here is your uh, detection of um, per copies, or in, number of copies per reaction, they vary from 8 to 20, uh, which is the level of sensitivity as shown here at the bottom as well in terms of per ml. So pretty sensitive. Um, now I'd like to just uh, switch gears a little bit and just talk uh, about um, uh, pediatric populations because we should not forget the little ones. Um, you know, they're very, very important. Um, so in terms of clinical manifestations in the pediatric uh, populations, uh, we know the common manifestations include the cold sore, the oral, oral labial herpes, and then chickenpox varicella. We're all very familiar with that. Um, but less common uh, manifestations, but that can be really severe. Uh, these include meningitis and cephalitis in pediatric population, uh, herpes keratitis um, and herpes zoster op ophthalmicus, and then there's the herpetic whitlow as well, which you know one can get as well uh, in their fingers. They put it in the in their mouth and they can get it that way. And then we also know the neonatal HSV VZV infection that can be transmitted from mother during birth. So a lot of different clinical manifestations can occur in the pediatric population. So uh, just to show you some highlights of the Simplexa VZV study, so far I highlighted uh, some of the overall findings, but now I just kind of sort of keying in on, on the pediatric side of things. So looking at the CSF cutaneous mucocutaneous swab specimens that were tested, uh, uh, in these studies in both pediatric and adult populations. So you can see the age group here from birth to one month, from uh, one month to two years and so on, you know, a nice breakdown. So if you just focus on the pediatric population um, for CSF samples and for mucocutaneous samples, you can see overall there was, for swabs, there was a greater than 97% overall agreement. 
and for CSF greater than 99% agreement. So that was nice to know that this assay definitely pediatric populations was included as well. Now, just talking a little bit about HSV, I know I focused a lot on VZV, uh, but this is uh, something interesting and that may be something you all may be aware of, those of you that work in the HSV, uh, in the pediatric population, that for diagnosing of HSV infection, um, the pediatric red book, which is the Bible uh, that is used by um, you know, a lot of medical centers, uh, they come up with recommendations. And one of the recommendations they've come up for HSV is uh, to swab, when you have a, a suspicion of infection, to swab the specimens from the mouth, from the nasopharynx, conjunctiva, and the anus. And these are called surface specimens. So you're not just simply targeting a lesion, per se, uh, but you're actually looking at these as, as a broad-based surface swab uh, specimens, which has been shown to be um, something that needs to be done for, for, di for detection of HSV in, in pediatric population. And they recommend uh, uh, you know, doing PCR for these as well, and all culture. So looking at the data, uh, this was a, um, a study that was published, I believe, in 2018 uh, by uh, Dom Dom Dominguez uh, et al. And they did a really good study where they compared uh, surface swabs uh, specimens for HSV collected in the manner I just described. And they did culture and PCR studies. And so you can see that the sensitivity of the culture, uh, you, they got three positives. With PCR, they had six positives. Uh, so 50% higher uh, sensitivity uh, when, when they did uh, PCR as compared to culture. So, and they also correlated these results. They were not false positive PCR, because one of the things that comes to mind is how do you rule out uh, that they could be false positives? They are not false positive because they compared it to the clinical truth. Uh, which is defined as uh, positive HSV PCR results from a vesicle, blood, or CSF specimen, and patient uh, received a full course of intravenous IV acyclovir by the treating physician. Okay, so these were corroborated by other clinical parameters, not simply a, a lab result. So, so again, PCR, hands down, is more sensitive than culture, especially when it comes to pediatric specimens as well. This is um, just showing, again, the HSV 1 and 2 uh, stratified data for, these, uh, for the Simplexa uh, studies. Again, look, looking at the age groups that were included in these studies, uh, from uh, pediatric populations all the way down to the adults. And in the pediatric populations, both the CSF and cutaneous, mucocutaneous swab specimen performed really well. So there is, for swab, there's greater than 90% um, overall agreement and greater than 95% overall agreement uh, with the CSF specimens. This is data for the ARIES, because ARIES also has an HSV 1 and 2 um, approval uh, for cutaneous and mucocutaneous swab, uh, this platform. And again, the age distribution of the, um, you know, that was included in the study ranged from uh, pediatric populations to adult populations. And again, in the pediatric population, there was a greater than 89% overall agreement uh, for the HSV 1 and 2. So, in summary, I know I presented a fair amount of data to you guys, but just in summary, uh, we know that uh, human herpes viruses are one of the most ubiquitous and successful viruses known. Um, and they are able to establish latent infection um, in, in the person and are extreme viral shedders. So they, uh, you know, this is something that's probably why these viruses are so successful and they get around because um, uh, people can be exposed. Uh, the clinical spectrum ranges, I showed you, from genital, dermal, ocular, uh, central nervous system, and, and also involves many organ systems. Um, and then prompt detection, we know, and diagnoses are critical for infection control uh, and for treatment as well, and for reducing the complications um, that can be associated with these viruses that contribute to morbidity and even mortality. Um, so I can stop here and take any questions. So thank you very much. Hopefully, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you very much, Pretty. And um, anyone who wants to ask any questions, please come to the mic. But I'll ask your first question for you. So you showed the CT values for the VZV study, and and uh, the PSC. 
PASCV workshop just the other day, there was quite a spirited panel discussion about um, the need to confirm uh, weak positive results, especially maybe in assays like VZV or HSV. So can you comment on that? And maybe also, what would you do in the case if you're running an FDA cleared assay and you actually don't have access to any kind of a value from that test? Because there are some like that out there as well. I'm sorry, if you didn't have access to what, Michelle? To any kind of a value. You just had a pos neg result. You can't look and peek at the CT uh, values. Yeah. Yeah, there are some assays we have in the lab where we don't get to peek uh, at the scenes. I think uh, you know, our multiplex panel doesn't give us the liberty of peeking behind the scenes, which is uh, unfortunate because it is nice to have CT value. Honestly, as a laboratorian, I love to be able to see the graphs, the curves, because sometimes you do see weird things come up, you know, interfering substances and stuff like that that just may give you an aberrant result. But to be able to see a nice sigmoid curve uh, for a real-time PCR is really gratifying to see. Um, and the low positive samples are always everybody's dilemma as to what to do because one day they could be positive and the next minute they're negative because it's right at that threshold. Um, so again, what we do is we obviously look at the patient history. We have access to the patient chart. Uh, we will run it. We will repeat it. Uh, but I don't think we'll repeat it more than three times. I think that's, that's a lot uh, for the lab to do. Uh, but we will take it upon ourselves to repeat it if it's something considered really clinically relevant and significant, we'll have a discussion with the clinician. But more importantly, we look behind the scenes and look at the curve uh, to see if it's, it's a nice sigmoid curve where we feel co confident uh, to be able to report it and, uh, rather than something just squibbly and then just kind of dying out, you know. Um, so we do have those situations. So having a CT, uh, access to the CT value is, is, is really wonderful to have. Hi, I'm Shelley from CareDX. <clears throat> what I'm wondering is, you talked a lot about the, um, the swab and the uh, CSF sample types, but have you done any work looking at correlations between those values in, um, in those sample types compared to blood plasma um, HSV values? Blood plasma for HSV and um, um, what is it? Um, um, VZV, VZV, you're saying? Yeah. No, we have not, um, because again, that's not very frequently um, ordered, requested by us. Uh, is that something that is that is something that you do, or do you get asked to do that? Um, yeah, it's it's on the panel of of organisms that I'm on an assay that I'm developing. Yeah. Uh, for the for the blood, you're saying for blood? Okay, okay. Yeah, no, that's not something that, I mean, it's a send out if it's requested, and it's only because it's not so frequently requested, we haven't really brought it in. Uh, so we haven't done any correlation studies. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you very much, Preeti.